It's now my pleasure to introduce Mike Reardon, CEO of uh, University of Chicago Hospitals, who will uh, start our uh, noontime lecture, and he'll do a few introductions of himself, by himself. <laughs> and of myself. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. I have uh, the opportunity uh, to introduce Mr. Studs Turkle. It's also the opportunity to first meet you. Uh, but more importantly, and I say that sincerely, more importantly, I have an opportunity to acknowledge an employee at the University of Chicago Hospitals who has worked here uh, since 1987. And that's the important thing uh, to talk about. And, and Tammy even reminded me of a connection we had after 9-11 where, uh, and to reinforce this, where she actually sent me an email and said I even replied. Uh, I, was, uh, I was very uh, delighted. It's, it's funny how a, an event like that can bring us together. Um, I'm reminded by uh, Tammy that uh, everyone in this room has a story equally as poignant as hers, but very different. We don't all have a gift of writing it down uh, and she has that gift, and we may not have the opportunity to impact as many people as she has, and she certainly has done that through at our ICUs or through uh, different patient care experiences, so I want to thank her for that. And then I also want to acknowledge that somehow the lab school plays very well into year two's history. Uh, as, a, as a father and someone who attends the lab school, is actually the lab school that brought Tammy back. Uh, Mr. Turkle has a connection at the lab school, and it reminds me of all the different connections here at the University of Chicago. When we talk about the richness of this place, we talk about being able to uh, meet with people from different disciplines in different areas. So we're, we're going to hear from a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School as well. So there are many different and unique connections here. So with that, it's my... Certainly my honor to say thank you for many, many years of, uh, of working here at the University of Chicago Hospitals. And it's now my opportunity to introduce someone who is uh, uh, locally at uh, the lab school and beyond, well-known, regionally well-known and nationally well-known, uh, Studs Terkel, who uh, has had an opportunity through his life and through his writings to talk about his stories and even most recently the story about his wife and his connection and, and uh, thoughts about life and about death and about all the things that are important. So with that, I would like to turn the podium over to uh, a University of Chicago alumni and, and wish him well in, in acknowledging a very great woman. Thank you. I should point out what a, what a surprise this is, and a delight, too. I noticed that for some people I do know, that is, I know their grandparents very well. <laughs> and what occurs to me is that you should point out that I'm deaf, quite frankly, I'm very deaf. Sometimes being handicapped in some ways becomes an asset. So during the phony Iraqi war we've just witnessed, we heard the phrase, continuously we heard the phrase, embedded journalists. But because I don't hear very well, it comes out in bed with journalists. <laughs> and I realize that having a certain deficiency, physically, hearing, turns out to filter out lies and only the truth remains. <laughs> Rather interesting. When, uh, how I first met, we're here, of course, to pay honor and tribute to Tammy, whom I know for a good number of years. In fact, when Tammy wrote her memoir, one Sunday afternoon, sunny day it was, of course, the day was Hiroshima. And I think of that, and then I realize years pass, and there was a 50th anniversary of Hiroshima Day at the Rockefeller Chapel, and I didn't expect any crowd there. I was there, and Kurt Vonnegut, and Tammy was magnificent, but the crowd was overwhelming 50 years later. So there is something called a memory, despite the fact that we live in a time that I call suffering from a national Alzheimer's disease. I think, for example, our, our appointed chieftain believes in that very much indeed, that there is no yesterday. And so 
Tammy hears a voice. My wife was in the hospital here, and I'm in her room, and Tammy hears my voice. She said she recognized me from my voice, but what she didn't hear me say was, I was using profanity and everything under the, because I had lost one of my hearing aids. I had this hearing aid. I couldn't find it. And Tammy being Tammy, she was a psychiatric social worker, so she knew she had a case with me. <laughs> and so she looks around and says, now where was it? This is, I couldn't got a new one. This, this is quite valuable. Without it, I'm absolutely deaf. So I couldn't find this one hearing aid. And Tammy, knowing the kind of whatever it is I am, looked at the trash can, and there it was, <laughs> about to be thrown out. So she has a certain insight, I think, into people. I think, though, I should point out, since you mentioned uh, the last book, it, it, Tammy has appeared in a couple of the books. She is the phrase we use today, she's a hero. We don't say heroine anymore. She's a hero of these books. But I think I should point out that in this last book, the one forthcoming, I have an interview, I went down to Columbus, so I interviewed Brigadier General Paul Tibbets. Does that name ring a bell to you? Paul Tibbets was then a colonel, and Paul Tibbets was the pilot of the plane called the Enola Gay. Then a certain Sunday morning flew the Pacific, 1945, and they chose a certain city in Japan called Hiroshima, and that's where they dropped it, and that changed the world. So I'm interviewing him. We're two old gaffers. I'm 90. This is about, I was 89 at the time. He's about 87 at the time. We're sitting in Columbus, Ohio, in this old diner and restaurant. Great hamburger sandwiches and beer. And I say, do these people know who you are? No. Do they know that you played a role in changing the world? He says, no, they don't know that. But uh, I guess I did have something to do with it. I says, yeah, you did. Well, tell me something. Describe the moment. And he described the planning of it, working with Oppenheimer, the great scientist in Los Alamos, who told him, you must make us one. You drop that load. By the way, the ship was called the Enola Gay, named after his mother. That was her name. And the nickname was Little Boy, because we're very whimsical about things. You see. The Little Boy was the name of this bomb. Now, three days later, another one was dropped on Nagasaki. And that was called Fat Man. See, we have a we have a whimsical quality. So as he describes the scene, his tension, how are you gonna do it? How are you gonna make that turn? Because you don't make that turn when you drop it, your plane will be incinerated as well. So he describes it, it's very dramatic. And later on his meeting with President Truman, with all the generals, and he's being honored. And then I say to him, That sounds pretty exciting, but we have what was, did a thought occur to you about what was happening down below? He's down below what? No, the people living there. Oh, well, yeah. Well, what was it? That tough luck? He says, well, that's tough luck. We had to end it. Would you, would, would, would you do it? We had a lot of talk about nuking people. Would you do it again? What, of course. Against whom? Against them. So suddenly I realized, this is George W. talking. <laughs> Instead of being kindred, as Thomas Paine had in mind, and as Tammy Snyder has in mind, kindred to the world, which is what Tom Paine's book, we find them everywhere. And so we're on the edge of loneliness. At the same time, I'm convinced that deep, deep down, there are millions such as you here, all over the country, and might I add, all over the world, because February 15th told me that. Remember February 15th? That was the day of all those demonstrations. They were not accidental. So I think Tammy represents all the goodness in us. And she describes her childhood, that moment, seeking her mother, singing that song her mother used to sing. She's singing for all mankind and remembering. That's why she's so precious to have as a friend and a colleague and a wisher. And Bob, of course, the very best indeed. And I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you laughed at all my jokes, too. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the chat. <laughs> Who's next? Tammy. Oh, right, here she is.
thank you so much for being here. It, it is a gift to me, especially. I mean, I, I feel it. I, I'm so honored, and I almost don't have any adequate words to express the depth of my appreciation for this enormous honor of this event and the gift of your presence, not to mention very generous comments from Mr. Redden and uh, everyone uh, I, I've spoken with today. And it reminds me of a story I, that was told to me many, many years ago. Um, a lady was traveling in beautiful New England during the Depression, taking in all the beautiful scenery and clean air, and she came upon a little village where there were large signs all over. It read, Strawberry Festival. Delighted, she followed the signs to the site of the festival where there was a small sign which read, Due to the depression, prunes will be served. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, <laughs> Recently, I was speaking with my daughter, discussing, you know, this event and the presentation. And she said to me, Mother, if I were looking in from outside, being in the audience, there were only two things I like to know. And she said, first, I want to know, how did you manage to stay a good person? What was all the things that happened to you uh, as a child? Because I know you're a good person. Of course, any child would say that to their parents. <laughs> <laughs> And the second thing I want to know is, how did you keep hope alive, she said. So my instant reply was, oh, that's easy. I had no choice, <laughs> you know, just to go on. And she's, her staunch retort was, no mother, everyone has a choice. So I said, you, you just, just, just don't understand about the Japanese culture, you know. Uh, if you're born Japanese and raised the Japanese, uh, you just don't have any room for disrespecting all the family's teaching from the baby days on. <laughs> and she was just shaking her head. And of course, if all it takes was to be born and raise a Japanese, there's no room for discussion on this subject of healing. <laughs> which is what I'm going to attempt to uh, reflect on with you this uh, today. Um, you know, the, the healing, besides having a, a somewhat austere cultural background, um, your prior experiences, the uh, your abilities or your constitutions and, and all kinds of things go into it. But um, um, what I think now when we discuss the subject of healing, I believe that the, this subject of healing is a changing state of trauma. And if it's, trauma is such a harsh word to most of us, say serious stress and hardships, transitioning to be restored to health and to normalcy. Now, normalcy and health is a condition of wholeness in which all parts function as by nature yeah. to function, thereby generating the self-conscious awareness of well-being. I believe that is a process. 
And its hopeful tone counters the pain and the suffering that uh, serious hardships or trauma bring. But the poignancy here is it's the very pain and the suffering of the hardship and the trauma that longs for relief and prompts your movement towards transition, hopefully transition towards healing, and if it's fortunate, towards transformation. That may be very powerful for an individual and others around them. And so that that suffering and the pain sets in motion for this process, that the two are in continuum, like a circle, as the title of Stas' last book, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? And all of us who've lived it all in this life know that it is a part of it all in our life, as in the words of Longfellow, into each life rain must fall. Or more modern uh, lines from Theodore Rothke, in the dark hour, the eye begins to see. More than half a century ago, as I recollect in bits and pieces, in a faraway land, I was a small child, and I was not aware of this sequence, pain and suffering, and then transition to healing. My, it sounds sort of ominous, but my life and my entire universe disappeared literally from in front of my eyes with a huge, unheard of bang and a force and gushing boulder <coughs> with a hissing sound, gushing boulder of radiation. engulfed in a pitch-dark mushroom cloud. Unbeknownst to anybody in the world except us, and we didn't know what it was all about, and except perhaps the small group of scientists, (coughs) politicians, leaders, uh, we were engulfed in the inferno, in the destruction of the force that, I don't know, resembled nothing I ever experienced because the force inside the mushroom was so strong. Forced people's eyeballs to pop out and stomach to be pop out. Skins with radiations melted away so that the people walked like they were carrying rags, except it was their skin, and hobbled. And some of us were pinned down, and I was pinned down under the debris of a beautiful, beautiful home that was built by my uh, ancestors with huge, beautiful gardens with lovely trees, flowers, bushes. Um, without realizing what it was all about. And it went shaking and breaking and everything coming down, and I was pinned down on seemed eternity that it seemed the end of life had come. I was in the sixth grade, uh, had no concept, really, of war, I guess. So, in this city, the humans were incinerated, torn apart, and staggered, if we could, out of the street to outside. The very sad part of my memory is that 
even the people who were incinerated on the outside and then <coughs> the, the veins were showing so nobody could take a pulse kind of situation, uh, they stayed alive. You know, the burned people, they stayed alive for a long, long time. They stayed alive for hours. They stayed alive for days, weeks, sometimes for years, and then for some, a lifetime of pain and suffering. Um, and you who are here, concerned with saving lives and restoring to wholeness, healing, would have different feelings, I'm sure, than the man who dropped it. Although I respect his stance as his duty. Here, in this kind of abyss where we lost everything, and we, you know, in 9-11, it was horrific, and it affected me so much that I, to the extent that I uh, wrote to uh, President Rayodon, um, surrounding healthcare systems too. You know, there were people who could really help out. When the city gets wiped out, when the, 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 there are no paramedics, there are not medical supplies, and there's certainly no one debriefing anybody. We were in stupor, and, and we somehow tried to seek safety, somehow tried to have food and shelter. Okay, in such a circumstances, Perhaps this is a trauma of a trauma, in, in sort of like a this. How does one begin to seek a transition, start of a transition, or movement towards healing? And I thought that I would uh, take us in looking at this question by, on one hand, bringing some descriptions of the trauma going on or hardships going on, and in those areas, what were so hard, but what were so very important to me personally that might help bring out some semblance of how you know, when President Reardon spoke of this experience, Tammy had, uh, other than being in Hiroshima, of, of a healing or participating in restoring the wholeness of the individual, physical and, and, and psychosocial, as social workers get engaged in, is a universal experience. So I'd like you to sort of like take a look at it as an universal uh, kind of process that could be, because we're talking about what it is, is the nature of human being. What do we require? What are the conditions that must be there as we can participate, even to look towards the parts coming together again and functioning as the nature intended for us? Okay. Now, the people, not just the people who survived this bomb, but the people who did not uh, actually, uh, were not bombed, <coughs> became also a larger uh, population of casualty because uh, in a, as soon as the fire subsided, you know, the whole town burned down. Uh, I think the 3,000 meters around were total destruction and total uh, the, the loss, they were all burned down. And the, uh, you know, the town spread uh, in different directions. Uh, some were broken but spared from the fire. Um, they came in, of course, uh, as soon as the fire subsided, <coughs> looking for their kins. You know, the children went to school and never came back. And, and people went to work and never came back. So they breathed the air and they, they stayed, you know, wandering around the whole town and then being exposed to the, the site of destruction. It was extremely difficult 
for all of us. Um, and and I, I will say this, and, and I like you to know that this is the reality of war, a nuking war. Um, you know, especially because this was the end of the war and we were just simply war-worn without supplies, um, you know, not very much to eat and uh, not very much clothing to, you know, if, if you wore out of clothes, uh, you know, you had to really remake something you owned before uh, because there were no new supplies. The, the, able-bodied men were taken to the front and, and the labor force was really very limited and there were no real, the abundant supplies of any kind. Um, so we were going out to pick grasses to eat, you know, uh, to, to cook, to eat. To, we, we were taking um, a beans or some other kinds of food that was secondary to rice. We were eating those. <coughs> Uh, so we were really quite emaciated. But uh, anyway, so in that situation, you know, there are no manpower to care for the, the, the dying and the sick. So people were carried out into the rescue stations, which in some cases were just a yard, you know, in front of a school or a police yard uh, or a temple in, in a, a chapel. And some, there were, you know, medical stations, but they didn't have anything to cope with an enormity of anything like this. They ran out right away, even um, a little, uh, if you had a salve, you were lucky. But uh, what do you call this, uh, the red, uh, like, mercurical, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. They ran out. You know, you you don't have a skin, and then you know you're going like this, and it just ran out completely. So, uh, one one station, uh, I remember hearing. They couldn't bear because you know the uh, burns get uh, sort of infested. This was in the middle of the summer, um, and then the uh, worms start to crawl in in, in your wounds because it's not kept uh, clean. So they just couldn't, the, the one young soldier uh, who was in an island, and then a lot of kids were shipped there because they were trying to uh, help out uh, in some public project in the center of town, and then some survived and then made it barely. They were carried to this island and were just totally burned. Uh, he he uh, asked his superior, I can't stand this young kid's just, you know, worms all over. And, and so he says, well, okay, boil the water, put in salt, and put the uh, balloon stick, and then go this way. And then because that's just sort of like sanitized, you know, and kill the worms. The minute they did that, the children just jumped up. And there's just half-dead bodies jumped up and started to run, saying, oh, it hurts, 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 and, you know, and dropped. Uh, and this was the extent, you know, of how they struggled to take care of the situation. Um, and some of them were left on the street to die. And then some of the people who were dragged were, you know, still kind of a moving. There was life. But we knew it was not going to be keeping long. So they were put in the corpse pile. Um, so... You know, not just survivors, but the others who participated in all of this scene, they were very deeply traumatized. And there were no real A's. Nobody could understand how it happened, what this was all about, and how it was going to be cured or healed. And there was no help. You have no idea how harsh that was. There's no help and no supplies. It wasn't anybody's fault, but it was just not possible to respect, accept, to cremate, and, you know, 
wish well. Okay. So, what was important to me that I could do? And this I must say, I think, as a universal human being to stand here to share with you, is that your body sometimes may be pushed to the point it's no longer can really do what it likes to do. But your mind sometimes has something left to back you up. And some of us here, if from the religious sector, will probably say confidently, and the spirit has power beyond. But um, I'm not going to get into that one. <laughs> now, let me just kind of give some examples of how some of these things that were important to me came through. And it was even from the very seconds after the de- destructive power of the bomb. The bomb was exploding, and I was in the middle of it, 1.1 mile away from the center, and in the pitch dark. And I was a sixth grade child, but something in my mind said to me, so this is dying in the war. And it was sort of like instantaneously, there was a something of a calm that came over me when I said that as if for just a mere, mere second, my mind had a mastery of something. And it's very important for human being to, you know, try to understand your relationship of your being to your surrounding and your reality. And, and of course, you know, getting hit with all kinds of objects and being thrown down, uh, I was busy sort of, you know, trying to uh, just sustain my life at that point. But I remember thinking that, and so I'm going to die now. And it, it was a sort of a calm feeling, even as a child, I remember, that came over me. And the next thing that um, uh, I discovered that uh, was a very surprising uh, uh, um, something of tranquility was after, you know, I sought help and, and, and some truck came by at the outskirt of the city and I jumped in. I, I was injured, so it wasn't kind of easy to just jump in and move, but uh, I was on the truck and then they carried me miles away from the city and, and, and a hospital and dumped me there and says, you know, do whatever you want. And, <laughs> it, you know, nowhere. I've never seen this place before. Um, and I was just following, you know, that's another thing I think that was very sustaining is our relationship in the reference points. In coming out, I don't think I would have made it out the burning city if my mother hadn't taught me and given me instructions what to do. You know, like I think I might have even laid there uh, helpless. The, uh, her words were, don't stay under the rubble. Get out from under the rubble if the house gets hit by a direct bomb. Get from under and then get away because the, you know, in those days, the, those were fire bombs that we were having. We never heard of any nuclear bomb. So fire bombs will set your house in fire right away. It says, if you stay, you'll be insinuated. You have to get away. And then she said, go to the river, and we had like seven, eight rivers in Hiroshima. You know, it was called the uh, Venice of the Orient. So it was easy to find river. And then, you know, and then she said, escape along the river. And, and also, uh, if there's nobody else to go, and you were the only one, there is a name of the village I can give you that you're supposed to go seek refuge. Of course, I never thought anything like that would be necessary, so I, I just barely knew the name of the village, much less how to get there or where it was. But from this hospital, I was supposed to find the village, and nobody helped me where it was or anything. It, it, everybody was too busy. You know, they, they were in dire straits, and they could not help anybody else 
although I think there were lots of people who were very kind and helped each other in different situations. But in that circumstance, I didn't get any help. So I was, I was sort of, you know, I don't know what to do, but OK, I'm, I'm, I have two legs. I'm going to start walking. And the, you know, that away, sort of like, I started to walk, and I couldn't go any further and I just collapsed and sat down. And I said, this is it. I can't go anymore. That's, that's the end of the road. You know, if I just die here, it will have to be. And then I just happened to look up to the sky. And there, it was no more mushroom cloud. The cloud was blue, clear, and cotton clouds, so beautiful. And in that shifting moment of looking there, brought back the memory of the pleasures of being connected, peaceful and safe and happy and nurtured. You know, and that sense transformed something of the message from my head to my muscles. And my head said, child, your legs are the only ones that can carry you out to this village. You must get up and walk. You know, it may be a little bit different from those of you who study uh, philosophy and then, you know, experience of Rousseau uh, floating in a lake in Geneva and looking up to the sky and then found the pleasurable sensation of being human and then looking into the sky. But there's something to that. You know, the nature that's intended for us, looking up, gave me a shift and a strength that I could get up again when body itself said, no more, don't stress me out anymore, I can't do it. But the mind and the connecting to the nature was renewed towards transition from the abyss. And to uh, make a long story short, let me just try to bring it, because I want to talk to you about my great appreciation of my, the opportunities I had at the hospital. Um, Studs alluded to it, but uh, something I did that was really being a human being, because you know, people went back looking for the kids, and it was terribly important for me to find my mother. I was an only child, and I was very close to my mother. And, and it, I just couldn't imagine life or world without my mother, you know. So <laughs> I had to find her. I had to rescue her. I had to save her, you know. So I, I went to, to the tracking, uh, looking over rescue station to rescue station. And, you know, people were very singed and uh, dying and, and, and suffering, and there was just very difficult to recognize anyone. And then I was, at each spot, I was wanting to, uh, someone to uh, say back to me, oh, I'm here. You know, here to call. That moment never came. Uh, but anyway, it became very uh, dehumanizing experience, shall we say, and like a Jay Lifton talking about survivors, massive psychic numbing. So I was getting into that psychic numbing, you know. But I still said, you know, you can't totally psychic numb about your longing for your mother. <laughs> so um, I said to myself, I can't bear this. I just cannot bear this. Uh, something got to happen that I have to find my mother and help her. But it's, it's nowhere, and I cannot uh, change the situation. I'm totally powerless. So mind again. I devised um, a, sort of like a perception, you know, that imagine that there was an imaginary possibility that if I sang and hummed little songs who which were favorite songs of my mother as I walked, that maybe she, wind could carry it and she could hear that and be comforted. So I sang uh, some songs. And in one of the interviews, Stas asked me to <laughs> sing that song. And I said, oh, no, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, but anyway, but we had a good time. 
Um, <laughs> and and, and uh, so I'm, um, you know, we got to go to a luncheon, so I'm not going to sing it, okay? <laughs> so anyway, and for the first time, tears just started to roll down my cheeks. You know, I was totally numbed and, 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 and sort of like, you know, people are dying, and oh, that's horrible, that's terrifying. Oh, okay, but I got to go to the next place. Oh. And I started to cry, and I believe that was the only and the first time and the last time I cried during that period because I was into my sense of being who I was, a child missing mother, you know. And I'm grateful for that time because it saved my sanity and sensitivity. When I think back about that period, I don't have to just totally say I, did, I was not able to do anything, which it is true, but I did my human best. And I think that's very important, being a human being. You know, I mean, I still feel guilty that I couldn't do anything about that, but that I did do my human best. Okay, now, um, let's make this as condensed as possible. In the ensuing years, I became a very serious youth. I was asking questions like, what is, t- what is the truth in life about human race? What is the meaning, meaning of our existence? I read and read and read, and I sought guidance from teachers and ministers and so forth. I'm afraid a lot of it was in vain because there was not an answer that I could really authentically, continually feel. This was why everything was taken away. And this was why everybody important to me died. Um, I think that's a human experience of trauma that grips you in such a way that it takes a great deal of transition. And perhaps some of it will never be transformed. But there were transitions in the sense that as I tried to continue raising questions and, and seek the light, so to speak, and seek the wholeness, the direction of healing, uh, which carried me to this country, to this shore, and and to attending the seminary, to completing my uh, human services training at SSA, and um, eventually uh, doing uh, work and training, um, child care, foster care, adoption, the psychiatry at Northwestern, and a private practice in the western suburb, and eventually to this hospital. The reason I came to the hospital, and, and please forgive me, I really had no intention of coming near the sick persons. <laughs> I had great aversion to being coming anywhere near hospitals because I think maybe I was in a denial and perhaps I suppressed my fear of being a cancer risk and health uh, uh, risk all my life which I have been told, and I said, oh, what are you talking about? I'm perfectly healthy. Please don't bother me with those kind of, you know, things. And I just pretended. I never was exposed to high, massive uh, radiation uh, dosage. Um, And I'm sure it helped me uh, in my outlook, but it did not help me (laughs) as far as my attitude of becoming a medical social worker, which I had no intention of becoming. And, but my Two children who uh, were getting bored in the suburban school system needed a little bit more stimulation, so I just, as an experiment, put them in a lab school, and they were very happy in lab school, and carrying them in the morning, and then coming back, and then picking them up in both rush hour traffic, having a private practice sandwiched in between, and doing all the household, you know, uh, duties and so forth. Just was so exhausting, I decided, well, this is ridiculous. I can maybe keep evening patients, but, you know, maybe during the day I can park myself on campus, even if I had to, you know, be an errand girl. Uh, And there was no job, except at the hospital. (laughs) (laughs) 
and I, I, I tried very hard, calling all graduate schools in different places, and I almost got a job down, uh, you know, the, the, new, the uh, uh, administration building. But uh, it didn't quite work out. And then so I saw this posting uh, from uh, Marsha Colon, a part-time job, and I thought, oh, heaven sent, I think I'll go. And then I interviewed for the job, and then they hired me. What they didn't know was being in private practice, patients always came to me, you know, and all I had to do was put my brains and my mind and everything just where I was and focus in trying to assist this person with the problem. Well, here in the hospital, you had to go to the patient, you know, <laughs> and TN2 so-and-so, what is that? <laughs> I had no idea how to get and find anybody. <laughs> now, how in the world are you going to serve a person if you can't find them? You know, and how do you talk to a person laid, you know, down like this? It's so very impolite to disturb <laughs> their resting position. <laughs> do you knock on the door and say, "May I please come in?" and "May I please know your problems?" <laughs> I, I, it was very much of an adjustment for me. And finally, I figured out there was a tower, and then there was this go away, and whatnot. And here was, and you know, so I was really adjusting, and it was very difficult, to say the least. But you know, I, I, I was, you know, because I, I have been trained as a therapist, I, I really, you know, was becoming interested in the work and transplant the first uh, assignment. This was really the breakthrough, the very first, uh, well, I don't want to call a person a case, but a case that I was given uh, was someone who was just, uh, had a liver transplant. And I was told to go and see or encourage this person in the intensive care. And if you know that I didn't go near hospital, and <laughs> near hospital rooms, you know I've never been to inside of any intensive care if I could help it. So I, you know, I was told to gown up, you know, this uh, great big huge things that's meant for tall, you know, American people. <laughs> I'm, I'm drowning in this garb. <laughs> totally safe and disinfected. Nothing of me was showing. <laughs> so, I, you know, with great trepidation, I opened the door and went in, and there was this lady hooked up to everything imaginable for life support, you know. And of course, she couldn't talk. And, and I had, you know, no prior knowledge or idea how I should proceed in this circumstance. But the what, just like a lightning that hit me. And I was so awed, was here was a person who was kept alive and being given a new chance for life. In every humanly possible way, that which I had longed to see 15 long many more years ago, that I did, was not, we were not given. And I thought to myself, Oh my God, this can be possible if you are willing to put the brains, the intellect, the sources and the resources. This is possible. And I felt so floored with joy that I live long enough to see that this can be possible today. <coughs> you know, that I could see that we did not have. What a blessing. And then there I was so encouraged and strengthened by that thought, I could go out to the person, lay my hand on her ha hand, and then tell her that we were all by her, standing by, and with joy supporting her new life, and for her not to fear, new life awaits. And it was such a pleasure to be a part of that. And from that day on, I was able to see the mission of this hospital as my own. 
and feel it as my own. Now, the second was a buddy of mine who was retiring early who had a gynec, a cancer service, and said, Tammy, you know, it's a half time. Why don't you, you know, become a full time and take this on since you are, you know, green surgery and uh, transplant half time. Don't you want to do that? <coughs> cancer, I said. Are you kidding? You know, I've been afraid of cancer all these years. How can I go near? And she says, oh, no, these are great ladies. You ought to meet some of them. You know, and then she was so enthusiastic. So I said, well, you know, it's ridiculous for grown women to be afraid of cancer. You know, I'm in the hospital. So again, making a long story short, I became also a gynae on social worker, and she was right. The vicissitudes that these women are going through and taking and managing and living with it with great courage as if it's just one of life's things, you know, instead of sitting and saying, oh my God, you know, I just can't do this. Nobody was like that. You know, Dr. Herbs, Dr. Rutledge, I'm sure, gave them or helped them have developed that confidence. Uh, that's how many years ago I was with the guy young. But, um, and, the, you know, like you would encounter a young person with young children and verbalizing how very much they wish that they could see the children graduate from high school or daughter being married. And yet it's not possible. They knew their life was limited. And, and yet they were fighting with all that they could. And you know, it gave me courage. My fear of cancer went out the window. You know, I, I was very, very blessed, is the only word I can say, that I was able to encounter. And from there on, the, my patients were my teachers. They taught me as I listened. They taught me every need, different types of experiences one can become a part of. And then I could become the part of their life and offer assistance or comfort or new ways of resource, which was just amazing. You know, I think the social work so often are so pressed with time having to, you know, come up with solutions for which the resources don't exist and that sort of things. We, we become sometimes even psychic numbed. And I think to myself, however, when we can step out of that, what we are given to do is such a privilege to take part in a time when assistance is so appreciated and needed, and we can step in and be a part. Now, the last step that I like to mention that was important to me was an opening came, someone who uh, had a uh, part-time and um, needed to uh, leave in radiation oncology. And because of the experience in cancer, I became very curious what that might be if I asked to be in that position. Because that was the last thing. If anybody had asked me a time before, would you be interested in being in radiation oncology, I would have said the same thing. Are you kidding? I would be terrified to even go near the physical facility of the department. And then so uh, this person said, you know, I know Dr. Sutton in the uh, department, and he's a very congenial fellow. Why don't you go down and say hello to him? <laughs> and he, he would just kind of make you feel comfortable there. I said, no, I don't know, Dr. Sutton, or what's he like? Oh, he's an old fellow with gray hair, and it's <laughs> very easy to talk to, and you know. Uh, so she dragged me 
you know, this lady. She just dragged me down. At that time, it was down in a basement. And you get even scared before you even got there because, you know, the small elevator was, it was really small. And a lot of patients who are claustrophobic had a terrible time because I don't think there was a stairway besides to go. But anyway, uh, and it, it, uh, it, it broke quite often, and you get stuck in it. <laughs> and you can't get out, you know. And then finally you get to the bottom, and then it opens to this dark, sort of a drabby-looking corridor, and then go into the, you know. Uh, so it, it was not the most cheerful greeting that I had physically, but um, Dr. Sutton indeed was a very kind and, and relaxed guy, at least to me, and, and said that he would be very delighted that if I could, you know, fill this opening. It had been left open, and, and no one wanted to go <laughs> for I think three or four months or some some time, and so they really needed a social worker coverage there. So. And then I remember walking into some of the, uh, you know, treatment rooms where this huge, you know, machineries were, and it, it it was just very scary to me, you know, and so I could understand why anybody who had been diagnosed by cancer walking in said, "I'm not going in there," you know, "You're not going to leave me alone." Some people said. You know, well, you have to close the door and you have to be alone. And I did work with a number of people who had that phobia so they could go in alone and, and the door could be closed and be treated. But I, I could sympathize how people could be so, you know, uh, anxious with that big, ominous things coming at you and, and then what's coming out can be lethal. <laughs> uh, and I know that it was lethal. When you know it's uh, uh, unleashed uh, in a destructive way, so that was my um, an auspicious beginning in the radiation oncology, and I had to learn from you know A to Z how uh, to uh, be assisting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, and it, it was the same story. I learned from each and every person that I met the state of human nature and human being and, and our potentials. How, you know, in health we could thrive, but in these conditions that we were thwarted. And to be a part of that and to be seriously consulted with their probing mind, the fear of death and fear of radiation, all of these was indeed a privilege for me. I really was grateful for all the contacts that I had. It enriched me as a human being, and not to mention the uh, scope of my uh, work experiences, uh, the depths of it, and, and expanded. I'm so very grateful. And here, as I reflect back to the years that I have been here, uh, that which that I did not think that I would even come close to, now it turns out has been a great honor and privilege and was a precious opportunity for me for my own personal growth, not only transition from my trauma of Hiroshima, but moving the, with the use of our intellect and our direction and the mechanism of our resources put together to serve so that human beings can have that self-conscious awareness of well-being. As I say, with the social workers' work, even during the time of illness itself, Feeling that wholeness is possible. I cannot thank you enough for all those of you who are here, who work in the hospital, that this has been a most learning period for me. And I commend your continuing work 
of life-saving, life-extending, and life-improving back to normal, normality and wholeness. It's a most fabulous profession and fabulous place. And those of you who are not hospital staff, but given me your sensitivity, granted me your respect, and accepted my input as valuable, I thank you for your presence in my life. And I can honestly and truly say today, life spared so long ago was given a priceless meaning because of all of you.